Thank you so much to the organizers for having me here. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. So first, let me share my screen. I've learned I don't know how to multitask. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, UCI Learning and Memory Conference has been um, some of the most formative education and training that I've received, even while I was a graduate student at UCSD. And I remember driving up those two hours really excited. And I remember as a second year grad student learning about, wow, it's not just about you know, nature, but nurture is really important through epigenetic mechanisms. And that you know, uh, learning about science can influence policy from Elizabeth Loftus's work. And, so this has been super influential. Um, so it's also so wonderful to be among some of the, the greats that have discovery, discovered um, you know, the basic mechanisms underlying memory, in which I'll highlight today as well. My lab is really interested in this um, uh, uh, kind of tug of war between memory stability and memory flexibility, which is what I will be talking about today. And so today I want to talk about how do we update memories, right? So across a lifetime, we are accumulating what seems like an infinite number of experiences. And every time we have a new experience, we need to integrate with that with our past information. So for example, here is, um, I took my kids to the dentist, right? And they had cavities, so they had, had to get it filled. And this is a pretty aversive experience. And Based upon the literature, we know that these memories are encoded in sparse neural ensembles distributed across the brain. Now, it would really behoove my children if they thought back and, oh, why do we have so many cavities? And they might think back to, oh, when their dad made them sugary raspberry gimlets. Um, don't worry, sans alcohol, these are mocktails. My kids are not 21 yet. And it would really behoove them if they could somehow link these two experiences across time such that then they can make predictions about the future. You know, maybe less sugary drinks or at least brush their teeth after they drink a lot of sugar. Okay, so this is kind of the central question for my talk today. Um, and so let's go back to the beginning, right? What do we know about how memories are encoded? And a number of studies, many that were done um, with faculty here, so, you know, John Gazowski, along with Bruce McNaughton, um, were some of the first to characterize that memories are stored in sparse neural ensemble. That after learning, um, they found that after contextual learning or spatial learning, that memories were encoded in the sparse neural ensemble in hippocampus. And when they brought the animals back, many of the same cells were reactivated as animals recalled this memory. And when animals went to a different context, different cells were reactivated. And so this suggested that um, memories, different memories are encoded in different neural ensembles. And Sheena Jocelyn, who is one of the pioneers of the memory engram research, who's also in the symposium today, was one of the first to show that if she selectively silenced just these engram cells, that she could get rid of the memory. And uh, Steve Ramirez, along with Shi Lu and Susumu Tanagawa's lab, who I see is also on the call today, were one of the first to show that just selectively reactivating the sparse neural population could artificially recall the memory. So there's a wealth of literature suggesting that you know, this, this memory engram or neural ensemble is a stable representation of the memory. And that, you know, depending on how similar or different the physical dimensions of the experiences that determine the ensemble overlap. So while I was a postdoc at Alcina Silva's lab, I was very curious, well, in addition to similarity of physical dimensions, what about similarity of time? By having two memories encoded closer in time, can we then also bias them into an overlapping representation as a way to temporally link memories? So what we did in that study was we brought animals um, into a novel context. Here we use calcium imaging and we're imaging their, uh, the neurons are activated in the hippocampus. And we see that uh, indeed a sparse neural ensemble encodes that context. Days later, we bring them back to um, a different context and similar to what everyone has seen before, a different neural ensemble encodes that context. Now the question was, now if we bring them back just hours later, closer in time than between the first two experiences, can we bias the neural ensemble into, closer, um, into an overlapping ensemble, which we did. Now, our, our idea was also super cool around the same time that Shana Johnson's lab showed that for emotional memories, that this happened similarly in the amygdala, that two emotional memories that encoded close in time also shared a similar neural ensemble in the amygdala. So this effect seemed pretty robust. Now, we were wondering, is the implication of this that then when we recall one of the memories, let's say, you know, the red box, 
are we more likely to then trigger the recall of a temporally related memory, the blue box, than the green box? So I'm going to walk you through the behavioral paradigm we use to study this question because this will be the behavioral paradigm that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk. So in this study, what we did was we brought them back two days later and we updated the memory with a shock, boom, right? And now they have this aversive experience related to the shock. And so to test the linking of the memory, what we do is we bring them back to the shocked context where they think, oh, shiznit, I've been shocked here and they freeze. Now, when they come back to the green context, which they were not shocked in, which they did not have this high overlapping neural ensemble, they recall being in the green context and they freeze much less. Now, what was really interesting was that when they come into the red context, right, they not only recall the red context, but that triggers the recall of the blue context in which they were shocked. And they think, oh, shit, and uh, freeze there. And so this is kind of um, our, our behavioral paradigm for looking at memory linking, the idea that we can transfer uh, one stimuli or one, you know, um, the valence of one context to another. And um, so I won't have time to go through all of the exciting work that is looking at temporal memory linking, but if you guys are interested, definitely check out the work of Shana Johnson's lab, um, who's looked at uh, emotional memories, um, along with Carl Inokuchi, Yanni Ziv, Mark Schnitzer, Jill Leukeb, and uh, Howard Eichenbaum have characterized how place cells and time cells um, also have these effects. And um, Allison Preston and Lila Javachi have shown some of this in humans. Um, along with uh, some of my collaborative work with Sarah Mednick and Mark Howard has developed theoretical framework for this. Okay, so um, this work that I did in my postdoc though, we were looking at here, you know, everyday neutral experiences and we wanted to know, but what happens if you make one of them really aversive? Does that alter the way memories are linked across time? And so these studies were led by um, very talented PhD student Joe Zaki, who's co-mentored by, uh, by Kanika Rajan, and uh, postdoc uh, Zach Pendington, who's also fantastic. So they are asking now, instead of a neutral context, the very first time they go into the context, the animals get boom, they get shocked, right? And does this alter prospective linking such that maybe it extends the window for memories to get linked to subsequent experiences and this is actually what I had predicted based upon the memory allocation hypothesis that maybe increasing the versiveness of the experience might increase excitability and increase linking. Now, Joe and Zach, who did not share this dogma, um, said, Denise, that doesn't quite make sense. Why would you want to link forward, right? That it makes sense if an animal had aversive experience, they would link it backwards in time because what happened previously would actually be better predictor of what's coming up next. And so they predicted that increasing the valence would extend the window retrospectively. And in these studies, we're going to use our UCLA open source mini scopes to look at the neural ensembles um, as uh, animals are freely behaving. So before we um, ask about how negative uh, valence influences the temporal window, what is that temporal window for uh, contacts that are initially neutral? So in this experiment, um, we are doing calcium imaging, imaging dorsal hippocampus, and we're imaging the neural ensembles as the animals explore two different contexts separated by five hours, one day, two days, and seven days. And um, what they find is that similar to what we previously published was that two contexts separated by five hours indeed have higher overlapping neural ensemble and this decreases by the next day. Now, what is the time course for behavioral linking? Because that's what we're really interested in. And so in this study, similar to the calcium imaging study, these animals see two contexts separated by the same time course. Now, um, the animals are brought back two days later and boom, giving a shock to update the memory so that we can um, probe their behavior. And we test them in the neutral context in which they've never been shocked. And we ask them when they go back into this unshocked context, do they transfer the fear and show increased behavioral freezing? So what we see here is indeed at five out when the two contacts were initially separated by five hours and they're initially neutral, we can update the memory. And here they link at five hours, but not if separated by the, uh, a day or more. Okay, so what happens now? This is the main question. Um, when the very first time the animals go into contacts, it's aversive, right? And so in the prospective condition, they're asking, do the animals prospectively transfer the fear to a, a neutral context that they will see sometime later? And again, so we test their behavior by asking how much do they freeze 
in the context that they've never been shopped in. So similar to what I just showed you, is that if these two contacts are initially separated by five hours, then indeed they transfer that fear from the blue box to a contact they will see five hours later, but not if it's separated by a day or more. Now, interestingly, in the retrospective condition, things are a little different. So in this design, what we do is animals are shocked in the blue box and we now ask, do they transfer the fear to contacts that they've previously seen by them testing the animals in this neutral context and ask, what is their freezing behavior? Now what we see is that not only are the animals freezing to this neutral context that they've never been shocked if it's separated by five hours, but they also transfer it to a safe box they've seen one day ago and two days ago. And this suggested to us that increasing this valence during the initial exposure is extending this window of retrospective linking. So while this was really interesting and not what I expected, but what my um, more talented and smarter grad student postdoc expected, you know, it makes sense, right? Ecologically, psychologically, you want to link backwards in time so that you can make causal inferences, but what is the neural mechanism that can underlie this? We were kind of at loss. So we went back to um, a simple calcium imaging study asking, well, is there increased overlap, right? Neural overlap that can be explained the behavioral linking. So in this experiment, this is using, again, uh, calcium imaging, and we're imaging dorsal hippocampus, while animals are here encoding two different boxes in one the second time they get shocked. And I just want to remind you that in the aversive group, they, um, they do transfer the fear back to the red contacts. And so during the initial encoding, we see there's no difference in the neural ensemble overlap between these two conditions. Right? So then we want to ask, well, what about at retrieval, where we see the increased freezing in the red context? So before we bring them back for retrieval, we wanted to control for the amount of freezing in the blue context. So here, we, um, in the neutral condition, we brought them back. We updated the memory with the shock. And now we're imaging during the retrieval. And we're asking, what is the neural overlap between these two contexts at retrieval? Now, what we see here is quite interesting, which is that some time between encoding and retrieval. So at retrieval, there's this increase in the overlap in the neural ensemble, right? Something is really interesting happening between encoding and retrieval. And we didn't really have a clue what was going on. So we went back into the literature. And, you know, there is a lot of evidence um, suggesting that after learning, um, animals go back to the home cage. And there's this phenomena, um, uh, most of uh, in the hippocampal literature, that there's a reactivation of the experience that just happened, right? And there's a very robust literature called neural replay in the hippocampus. So um, we expected that to happen. And um, work with uh, Sarah Mendick when I was at grad school suggested that also during this offline period, memories are not just reactivated to be consolidated, but memories are also integrated with past experience and that this happens during sleep. And so we thought, well, maybe increasing the shock will increase the likelihood of reactivation of both of these memories. And further evidence from Andre Fenn's lab suggested that if you increase the stress level of an experience, it increased the temporal window in which you can um, interfere with past experiences. So this led us to the hypothesis that increasing the shock um, or the aversiveness of the experience is likely to not only increase the reactivation of what just happened, but maybe the brain searches for past experiences to relate the memories to. So um, to, to ask this question, we use a slightly different uh, paradigm. And here um, we have two groups and we're doing calcium imaging, um, imaging again in dorsal hippocampus. And in one group, the second context, they get a low shock. And in the other context, they get a high shock. And we're really interested in what's going during this offline period, right? So this is a time period between the encoding and the retrieval. Here, we're only imaging that first hour after encoding. And the hypothesis was that increasing that shock would increase the likelihood of the reactivation of the neural ensemble representing the red context. Okay, so for this experiment, what I'm gonna show you are the data um, just during this offline reactivation. And we're, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take all the cells that we see 
that are active during the offline act reactivation that have occurred in that one hour after learning. And um, we're going to assign each of these cells to either ensemble A, which means that they were previously active in the red box, or ensemble B, which means they're previously active in the blue box, or there were cells that were active in both boxes. So we'll put that will uh, categorize them as ensemble A and B. But most of the cells were not previously activated in either boxes, and we'll just call that the non-ensemble. So in the low shock group, what we find is that um, across this hour, and this has been across 10 minutes, so uh, this is why the data looks so smooth, but what we see is that, you know, consistent with the replay literature, that the ensemble for this blue box that they just experienced is much more likely to be reactivated than other cells that were not previously part of any of these ensembles. And interestingly, the ensembles that were just activated in the red box are much less likely to be reactivated than the blue box, but still above um, the remaining ensemble. Okay, so this is you know, what we would have expected. What's really interesting is that in the high shock group, what we find, um, the, the, the finding that kind of jumps out at us is the ensemble representing the red box is increased similarly to the ensemble um, representing the blue box. And so then we thought, well, if it's the, the reactivation of both the ensemble of the red box and the blue box, what if we selectively just silence the ensemble of the red box during that time, can we get rid of memory linking? So in this next study, um, we are, the idea is that we selectively just silence the ensemble of the red box while there's still reactivation in the blue box, can we get rid of linking? So um, to do this experiment, we collaborate with Steve Ramirez um, using their tag dread virus. And here, we're going to use an activity-dependent tag to tag selectively the cells that are active in hippocampus and amygdala during um, learning of this red box, right? And then after the animals go into this blue box and they both get shocked, then we're going to inject clozapine to try to selectively silence the, this ensemble of the red box. And then we bring them back and say, okay, now do they transfer the fear? Can we block the transfer of the fear? Um, and then do they generalize it to a novel context? So in the control group, what we find is what you would expect replicating our previous results, which is that indeed in the control group, they transfer the fear from the shocked, uh, the shocked box, the blue box to the red box. And this is specific as they do not generalize the sphere to the novel context. Now, what's really interesting is that by selectively silencing the neural ensemble of the, uh, the red box, we're able to get rid of memory linking. And again, they also don't freeze to um, the, the novel context. And so this suggests to us that, you know, it's really important for at least the, the reactivation of um, this red context, probably also the blue context, to be able to link these memories during this offline period. Okay, so to summarize what I told you so far, which is that um, the question I set up at the beginning of a talk is how is it that we link the the, our current experiences to the past so we can make predictions about the future. So here's our working model. We know we still have a lot to do, which is that after an aversive experience, this memory gets encoded in a you know, sparse neural population distributed across the brain, I'm sure. And during some offline period, there's not only reactivation of we, what we just learned, but it's almost as if the brain is searching and reactivating other experiences to relate it to so that we can make um, links um, to the past to make predictions about the future and inform our decision making. So just in the last um, minute and a half that I have, I just want to talk a little bit and give an update on the, um, the UCLA Miniscope project that started when I was a postdoc with Alcino Silva and uh, collaborating with Paymon Goshani, Daniel Ahavroni, and Tristan Schumann. And um, so a lot of the studies I talked about were um, uh, done with the original Wired uh, Miniscope. And last year we released the um, wire free version, or I like to call the no strings attached version, which um, allows us to do untethered um, recording. And we've shown that it's much better for a number of uh, behavioral paradigms, including social interaction. And since I moved to Manhattan, I can tell you, you know, I ride the subways. And so I know that rodents are not contained in small, small boxes. And so to really understand, you know, how is it that they encode large environments? 
how is it that they encode large environments and we can use this to look as they explore um, large environments. Um, I, we are also developing a multi-channel miniscope. Um, this is a dual channel miniscope. I don't have a lot of time to get into, I'm happy to chat more later. Um, and uh, this is one example, uh, multiplexing YFP and CFP so that we can measure fret responses. Um, we've also developed a couple um, analysis pipelines to increase accessibility and um, transparency and robustness for the community. And so um, Phil Dong just we just uh, released Minion, which allows for calcium imaging analysis and as well as behavioral analysis, easy track. And that is that is it. But I just want to, um, I don't know if you can still see my screen. My last thing, I just want to acknowledge everyone that did the work, my funding agencies. And I want to end to say that Black Lives Matter and Asians, we belong here. So thank you.